Minister, you're an advocate for women and have fought for years against the discrimination and abuse of women and human traf trafficking of young girls. I understand the Guyana Women's Minors Organization, the GWMO, was formed in your efforts to end these, those abuses. But before you talk, we talk about GWMO, can you tell us about the formation of the OMI Small Mining Committee and what <laughs> role you actually played in that? The, um, the OMI um, um, Committee, the Small Miners Committee, it came about again um, with small miners, um, you know, having no attention, was so vulnerable. And so um, in the then time, there was a lottery um, where my small miners wanted land so badly to work, having all your investment there and no place to work. Everybody grab onto it. And so thousands of small miners was placed into the area. But what happened is that at that time, there was no consideration. It's just, oh, give them a piece of land to keep you quiet. You see, the idea is not about land. It's about coal. And um, they did not look at it in that way and do research and give us an area that is feasible. So everybody ended up in there and everybody just panicking because there's no money to move out. Um, persons got mortgage and it was a horrible situation. And I thought there was a reserve area uh, by the state at the time that we did some investigation on that was feasible. And so I went forward and I started to write letters and come to George and negotiate that time with the Prime Minister, um, Sam Hines, um, Ropes and Ben at one time, Prime Minister was out and Ropes and Ben was acting and, and really pushed. And so after several engagement, um, the Prime Minister then was overseas and Ropes and Ben um, came into the back down there at Omai. And um, I put forward um, to the government then to allow us a little area rather than have persons going to, to raid illegally, you know, you know, mine illegal and so on. So he agreed and he said, if we have a committee, so I said, we already have a committee. Um, and so I just called a few miners there on spot and said, listen, we are a committee. And so we are ready. And um, coming down to George, so this time when I call in my colleagues and say, use a member, use a member, they're looking at me, what is she talking about? I said, yes, you are a member. I found immediately on spot, get the problem with the committee you want. <laughs> Listen, you want to live, committee did. You remember, you remember, you remember, you remember. That's it, right? <laughs> and that committee was formed right there with, with the persons. Um, and the negotiations keep going, and Prime Minister Samhain came back, and uh, we got an area the back here um, where we could have um, been given the opportunity to work to recover some money um, and things like that. It, it, it was not an easy road because even then, while the Prime Minister agree and all of that, you had a system and people still coming there from the, the commission in those days and picking up your equipment. It, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. And um, because they had bigger persons with interest behind the area, and at the damn time, you know the word corruption. I did not create that word. That word was not formed by rules. No, it was not. Um, but that was the order that they had. So the bigger persons who were interested had persons in the system that really pushed us out of the area mm -hmm. by seizing our operations. I myself got all my equipment seized, excavator to excavator, um, my engines and everything seized. So what? I don't know and for weeks and months. but. They did that to me as a person who having the, um, the, the committee because they, they felt and they understand that once they pressure me and get hold of me, um, then the people, they would get them out of the area. So in order to, to get us while we, we did not raid, really it caused us to pay a fine $250 and we started to comply with everything. Um, we look at the water and pollution. If you see us mad, we fluct, we have blue water in the tail end thinking that, you know, it would have worked according to plan. But um, the pressure came on and they, they took my, my engines and everything and they seized it and had it for months, months, months and got me back and through paying a million and um, $200,000 a month for an excavator that they just held on to. Um, and so it was really, really horrible. But um, again, 
that again was fighting mm -hmm. for the rights of like, people and to make a difference and that 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 change. Um, I don't know why I'm so fortunate to be quite honest to always find myself in in those positions. So that is what went on in in those days at the, my um, um, small minus group. You those um conditions or acts against you the you were you were threatened you were under constant threat physically assaulted in april 2013 while rescuing victims targeted by the same authorities you wanted to partner with the fight against these um atrocities you got public bashing you were accused of assaulting an alleged officer that that was dropped that that was thrown thrown out but why didn't you just quit minister brooms what made you continue my experience, I was thinking at that time, with my experience, if I quit, mm. who will then stand up? I had to, I had to stand up to encourage not only women in Guyana, but like you said, around the world, Africa, wherever you're at, to be encouraged. By standing up, you can make a difference. We don't always have to bow. You know, we don't always have to. And I, I believe in the Bible and I love the Bible. And I would not lock my mouth in water like the log. I will dip a drink of it because I got to be fit for the battle. And so I stand up because I really wanted to make a difference and to be that person that to encourage other women that we can do it. We need to do it, you know. And so, so, I, so I had to, like, I could not quit that passion for my people and what I do and what I believe in. It, it, it was more if I did. You know, I, I was going I to ask you, I was going to ask you, what is the message you hope your journey as an activist and as a businesswoman and a politician and so on would say to young girls? But, but you answered it eloquently just now. Several years ago, you were recognized as a hero of the United States of America and awarded the 2013 TIP Hero Award by Mr. John Kerry himself, Secretary of State. What, first of all, tell us what the TIP Award is, but what did this award mean to you and how did it actually speak to you? Uh, I think that that award was timely. It was really timely because um, it was lonely. Um, it was tough. And um, the pressure that you mentioned about being threats and all the allegation against you and the untruth um, that was leveled against you. In Guyana, as a Guyanese and as a woman, while I'm fighting out there, a lot of persons, let me tell you, I would go to workshops and I would have to be invited by either Canada or US or the UNDP and so on, not by the government of the day because I was not, I was not qualified to, for them. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, even the persons there from all the NGOs and civil society, they did not, they, you know, they didn't even talk to me publicly. They would just whisper in a corner or give me a little note and say, you know, you're doing a good job and so on. But when they catch me, like if we go into the restroom area, you already know the government wants to see we associated with you. Um, you know, you want to victimize us too, but you should keep doing what you're doing. And I said, why are you saying that to me? I don't need your sympathy. I need your support. Right? And if you can't support me, I mean, I don't need sympathy. I, I already am against a big giant and you come and sympathize with me. I don't need sympathy card. I need support. Right? And so I would tell them that quite frankly. So that award now, when, when, when that was done and when I got there, and to recognize that there are other persons around the world who believe in the things like I do, it was a tower of strength yeah. and an encouragement to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, interacting and um, listening each other's stories and things like that. It was unbelievable. So I was inexperienced, you know, to a lot of things, and to even knowing that listen. Persons out there, I didn't know U.S. was was looking. I don't know U.S. had was doing a report on trafficking a person. I did not know that. All I know, I'm a woman from the extractive. 
my experience with what I see and what is happening there, I got to do something about it. I have to do something about it. And that is what I knew then. Uh, and so coming back to Guyana, uh-huh. when I get back to Guyana, oh my gosh, let me tell you. Everybody became my friend. Hi, how are you? And so I really want to help you. And uh, you're doing a good job. And people started talking to me in the pocket. And I'm wondering, is it me? Mm-hmm. You know? So a lot of things um, changed. I think that the breeze that the U.S. blowed behind me, uh, um, you know, on Secretary of State and so on, that came like a nice perfection. Um, it empowered. It, it, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, my experience mm. that really caused me to go around the corner. Yeah, you know, to go it, around the... you mentioned you didn't know that you were being watched, you're being observed. So it gives me a good segue into this question. You, you've um, had relationships with the United Nations, the International Development Bank, the U.S., Canadian and British governments. What surprised you the most about these relationships? But I think what surprised me most in the relationship is that they respect me for who I was and what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nothing in any way of attacking anybody, the British, the European, everyone, um, CARICOM, um, and everybody just said, listen, this is what you're doing. How could we help? What is the area? You know, even if it's in training, how can we be of support um, to you and, and things like that? So I think it was really unique, um, the relationship um, that we've had. And just to know that people, while they were not um, Guyanese, their interest is still to see Guyana in a better place of Guyanese people. That, that was a conversation um, um, there. And so I think it was, it's, it was really unique. It was a great relationship um, working with, with each and every one of them. Um, I would always want to continue to work with, with all of them. I remember the British High Commission. I remember the first time I went to the Canadian High Commission and uh, with this organization. And when I talked about the objectives and what we want to do and all of that, he said, it's unbelievable. And I had a luncheon of the organization and invited them. And they all showed up to the luncheon. All the diplomats wow. uh, showed up. And that was from the from this beginning in 2012 when, when it was formed. And so that support... Um, was there because I, I went to the, 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 the diplomatic corps, I, I wrote them, shared the constitution, spoke about what is it I want to do, why is it, and all of that, my experience and how I want to, to assist my women um, in Guyana and more so in the extractive, which is male dominated. And I got that support from the outset um, and the launching of the organization. And it just got better and better because um, when I got back in a few months, um, the Canadian High Commissioner said, you know what you did? I mean, you have outworked what you said you would have would have done and so on. And so they were really encouraged um, to, to, to work. So that relationship really, really went well. Um, all the days within the organization and in my advocacy and so on. And um, I mean, we still have a, a wonderful um, relationship, um, even even um, up to now. But, you you met all the Morrissey's um, sisters. Yes. Um, they, I would want to um, single them out and just to do that. Uh, was a was an older uh, one of the Morrissey sisters, and um, she was reading in the papers and um, wanted to meet with me. I did not know she was reading in the papers and asked me if I would do a presentation with the Mercy Sisters in the Carly Church. And I said yes, and I showed up at the venue, and, and she had a whole board with all the clippings, all the articles that was in the papers with me. And I did the presentation there, and the bishop um, for the Carly Church said, what is the one way that we can help to make a difference? And I said, if it was a building, um, that the church had to have the first home ever in Guyana um, for the victim of human trafficking because their situation was horrible um, when they were rescued. That was a painful area for me to see what they went through then and how could that change. And he said, okay. And we started to work from there and then he made a building available 
Sister Juliet really worked with me to raise all the funding with the organization um, to repair the home. The Canadian um, government, um, we did a project with them to furnish the home. And um, I think I think it was really, really wonderful. And I will always want to um, talk highly of them mm -hmm. because they one uh, one group, um, the Mercy Sisters, and many sisters do that. I mean, she's only you now that really, and in fact, let me tell you, you know what she said to me? She said to me, and I would never forget the first time I, I met her. She said, I know what you're going through, and I know it's, it's hard for you. She said, here where we live, there's a room for you. If ever you want to come to have prayers and to be quiet, there's a room here for you. And they had a special room that she showed me downstairs. Um, if ever I wanted, or if I want somebody to talk to, I would go there. She put her hair in, ear, in her ears and um, she would always talk with me and encourage me. So um, the Marcy sister, yes, you were right. They played um, a major, 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 major role um, in, in those days. M Minister, oh. how can the diaspora help with this? The trafficking in person? Yes. I think that um, first, the, what area would you want to help? Prevention, protection, prosecution. Um, what area the diaspora would want to help? Do you want to help in preventing? Do you want to help um, to see prosecution? Do you want to help in terms of the, the lives of the survivors? Um, how do you want to help? And, you know, because different persons would want to help in different areas. I'm, I'm... If it's if in fact um, to give hope to a survivor and educating them, um, scholarship, seeing them go through school, mm -hmm. there are different areas that the diaspora um, can um, can help um, with, with, with situations and, and, and survivors, I don't like to call them victims, survivors of human trafficking. Yeah. There are several, several ways. Minister, I'm, I'm sure there are people who are trying to find out how they can get information, who should they contact, where should they go? And I know from personal experience with, with, with the CWS anniversary, because that was one of our charities, that for security reasons, and the dress is not given and so on and so forth. But if someone wants to make a donation in whatever area, is there something set up that they can do so? Well, um, yes, and I want to say, um, before we go to the donation, you say persons want information and all of that. You do have the task force. You have the Ministry of um, Social Protection. You have the home, which is, um, the more, it has a board um, with the Mercy Sisters, and you do have the Women Minors um, organization um, there. If you want to support um, a survivor, um, depends on the age of, because it's a very sensitive um, issue here, depends on the age of the person, of course, and if they're in the state care, which is social protection, then you can go through them or you can go through the, the board which manage the, 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 the shelter and they can be able to take the support and, um, and, and filter it directly to the survivors and, and, and things like that. Minister, so you, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Um, and, you know, even to, today, um, I was at the Gallant Geology and Mines Commission. The commission has a budget um, for the for trafficking in person. And I was talking there, and I'm going to meet with the, the team that will be working from through the commission. And their area is just prevention because mm -hmm. um, trafficking is a crime and that is a police matter mm -hmm. yeah? yeah but all of us play a, 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 an important role here especially the mines officers in the field the mine station if you see anything how do you report you know how could you assist somebody of getting out of the area and bringing them to the police or and things like that so let me make that clear mm -hmm. we are now responsible neither we but what we're doing is when we meet with them to educate and to point out in very strategic areas, how can we be uh, of support? Because the extractive industry, of course, it is known, it is easy, um, it is remote, and a lot of these things happen. 
and the government of a whole, and I will not sit in the Ministry of Natural Resources um, and have oversight over GGMC and forestry and things like that and not contribute our bit and try to ensure we fight for a slavery-free extractive sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so that is high up on my agenda. Minister, if I, I may ask, with your permission, that we go for just another 10 minutes. We started late, and so I chose not to take a break. I apologize for that. But um, under the circumstances, is that, is that okay with you? Well, I mean, again, what do I say? It's okay with me. <laughs> I mean, you you now got me on the route, man. I mean, I'm talking to persons. I'm sure you have an audience. Yes, so, they're I'm listening. Saying, they're you know, I mean, all the places too hot and thank you. I cannot, you know, I, I have to stick here with you. So I have no problem. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, someone asked me to ask you today about Guyana's oil and what it would mean to Guyana's development in about 10, 15 years. But let me ask you the question this way. When you sit in your quiet moments, and you think oil, and you think after it goes into production and oil is coming up and so on and so forth, where, how do you see Guyana after that? You know, the first thing I want to tell you, I want to leave. I pray and say, Lord, give <laughs> me long life long. My God, I want to see this thing. <laughs> so let me tell you that. I don't know, and I want to encourage people. I am praying to my God, yes. to keep me, because I want to see it, because it's going to happen, right? So I'm praying and thank you right now. Again, I'm going to say publicly, Lord, keep me, please. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> Diana, I was in Anne's Grove a few weeks ago, and I was saying to the young ladies, Guyanese, you, we should not be thinking of men on roads right now infrastructure and the government with the will before the oil money these things already start happening Guyana will transform Guyana will become a state of the art country hmm. the country that everybody will want to come over let me tell you quickly you know people call it from all over the world and said but you know my great great grandmother was a Guyanese and um so I am a Guyanese and I'm okay yes but you know, people now are looking for their roots in Guyana but <laughs> some people in Guyana and I mean the, the politics and all of that try to you know tell people but Guyana has a brilliant future um with oil and the wealth yeah we have Few people in Guyana, you know, few people. And um, His Excellency said he started with a good life and then a better life. The future of Guyana, in my sight and my imagination, is beyond your mind. When I relax and, and I move over Guyana and think about where Guyana will be in the next five years. And let me tell you something. Um, I don't care if you say it's political, but the May in 2020, which will be our first five years. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Fourth five years. Because we're going back into office. <laughs> and by the time our second five year in office, I mean, Guyanese people, it's unbelievable. I, I like I like this topic because you said me dreaming like and I heard a preacher said, yeah, they the guy. He's like, oh, if you call it all, to call everybody, you rather not be called the one. Oh, it's a true, true story. <laughs> uh, I myself love the oil. Uh, and I love the fact that it's here in Ghana. And I'm living to see the day for Forest Oil in 2020. But I want to say to all Guyanese all over the world and in Ghana and, and persons all over, it's, it's not a dream. It will soon be a reality. Yeah, and definitely um, will will we'll transform. His Excellency, when we came into office, talk about linking the hinterland with the coast and all of that. I mean, you're talking that we linking literally driving from here to Kamran and in Bamadai. I mean, 
Oh, what would we talk about the water? If we can build a tunnel still, or that's still a man. We, we can build tunnels. We put highways all over. You just jump in a carriage, driving around like you're in America, and driving from this city to that city and all of that. So even the hinterland, I'm excited about our indigenous brothers and sisters, how their whole life will be transformed. Technology right there. The opportunity to education, that equality, because we all guidance and for too long because the person's on the coast or the hinterland, you know, it's different in your lifestyle, information and all of that. Um, all of that will be something um, of the past. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> I, have, I have a fantastic, I could talk about this thing like for the next 10, but I know you got more things to talk about. I don't um, the viewers could understand how I, I raise up in my seat and so on, you know, uh, the sadness and the traffic. And I like that bounce back question because you give me a little heart pain just now when, when I talk a little bit traffic. But you bring me right into the oil, so you bring me back on track. I mean, I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, I'm going to put...